Well, it's great to have Larry McCarthy on Zoom. Larry, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome, Valerie. Newly elected the GA president this year, and I'm sure um, afterwards the post the post election hasn't really been a smooth sailing for you. I know a lot has been going on in the world at the moment. And first of all, you've been, you know, what has it been like in New York during the pandemic? Um, not to put too fine a tooth in it, god awful. Um, when you consider that this is the supposed economic capital of the most advanced nation in the world. And what do we have? Visions six weeks ago of people being buried, mass buried in pauper's graves. You know, that was harrowing, to put it mildly. Um, I must admit that I thought that putting a field hospital in, in, in Central Park um, was sobering. But Lord, when you see people being put in potter's graves, it just, you know, shakes you to the core. Um, having said that, though, we, the city has come through it. The, the state has come through it um, reasonably well, I would suggest to you, in terms of well, the numbers are awful anyway. Um, but it's beginning to open up in the last couple of weeks. Um, I actually live out in New Jersey, which is in a similar situation um, where we're coming through it. Um, and areas of both states are now beginning to open up. But at the height of the pandemic, Valerie, it was an awful place to be, to be living in, no matter what way you look at it. I mean, was it a scary place to be, Larry? Were you anxious? Did you feel intimidated? By Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, you were anxious. You were. Um, no, I, I wasn't inside in the city. Um, I was hunkered down here. I live in a town out in New Jersey, which is about half an hour outside the city. Um, we weren't as restricted as you guys were in Ireland, but people weren't moving. Um, people weren't moving outside the town, outside the, the suburban town. Um, they weren't around. They weren't on the streets or anything, you know. Um, it, was, it was harrowing, to put it mildly, you know. Unfortunately, not only have you been dealt with the coronavirus, but I think there's been a lot of maybe violence and in maybe protests. And we're seeing a lot in the news over the tragic death of George Floyd. And, you know, seeing those in the news of for here, for us, we can't imagine what it's like for you in New York. Well, yeah, I mean, there have been protests up, up and down the city, well, across, across the whole country, obviously, but they've been fairly intense um, protests in the city initially the first weekend. Um, and protests continue. My two sons have gone into one now, for instance, this afternoon. Um, but arguably, it's a depressing country to be living in. You know? um, and at some level, the pandemic will, will, will pass. Racism will take an awful lot longer to pass um, because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not inbred, but it's, it's, it's virtually everywhere in, in this country, no matter what we say about it. And I would argue it's, it's virtually everywhere in the world, you know, uh, no matter what we say, there are traces of racism, I think, in, in virtually every society, um, whether it be bias against people of different color, bias of, of sexual orientation, whether it be bias against religion, there's biases everywhere, you know, and this one is manifested, obviously, in, in, in race, and it's manifested, obviously, in, in the killing of black people, you know, or black men in particular, um, over the last number of years, go back to Rodney King, for instance. So when you combine um, COVID and um, the death of George Floyd. Um, it's not a happy country um, and it, it sort of needs to change, you know, um, I would suggest politically and, and, and socially. Oh, you mentioned that it's all over the world and especially in Ireland this week, I know some GA players have come out saying that they've experienced racial slurs during games and to see it in our own national game, Mary, you know, it's, there's no place for it anywhere in the world, but to, you know, for have these players to speak out during the week, it's shocking. Well, it is. I mean, but I mean, that, that goes, I suppose, go back to my point that it's everywhere. We, we can't hold up our hands and say we're innocent of it either. And, but it has no place in the GEA, Valerie. You know, absolutely has no, it has no place in society, period. But it sh certainly shouldn't have anything in, 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 in our national games, in our national institution called the GEA. And there shouldn't be bias against anybody, not on, just on the basis of race. I mean, on, 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 on any, you know, meter or any, any what's the word I'm looking for? Um, whether it be religion, whether it be um, physical challenges, whether it be mental challenges, whether it be travellers, whether it be you know sexual orientation, there shouldn't be any bias anywhere. But the reality is that there is, and so um, it's shocking that the players have come out and, and revealed this. But is it surprising um, that it's in our society? Probably not. Well, hopefully, everyone talking about it can make a change. You know, this is what everyone. This is why we're talking about it because hopefully, people can realise what they're saying is wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I mean, I think we're the first organization to have an inclusivity officer, sport organization in the country. Um, and, and 
like a lot of things that the GEA do, we, we do it quietly. We're, we have educational programs, anti-racism programs, um, the, the mantra of the, of the institution for the last, I suppose it would have been it's on a marketing term for the last two or three years has been where we all belong. And, and, and the emphasis has to be on where we all, you know, every one of us belong in there and there should be no bias against us. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we're slowly educating people about, the, about racism and about the impact it can have on children in particular. Um, and we'll continue to do that, I think. Brilliant. No, and that's all we can ask for, I think, within the GA community. But how has been the GA community in New York? How has maybe the coronavirus impacted G? Well, hugely. Um, hugely for a lot of us in terms of some of the people here um, would not have been entitled to um, compensation through the governments, um, through the local authorities and stuff like that. So um, a fund called Slaint was created at the behest mostly of the New York GA, I would suggest you, um, and Seamus Clark. Seamus Clark is the sponsor of the Leitrim football team at home. He owns a bar on the Clean Avenue. And he got a whole bunch of us together the day after New York closed down and said, we have to do something here. And so Slaint grew out of that, which is a fund for the undocumented. And so it has helped people greatly in terms of giving them security of food and security of accommodation in the last couple of weeks. Um, in terms of games, there's obviously nothing happening. Um, although having said that, our GDOs, like virtually all GDOs across the world, seem to be doing a phenomenal job in terms of training and coaching online and putting out programs. Mickey Quigg is, is our GDO, and he's in the unfortunate position is that the, um, the American government, the American consulate in Belfast has his passport because he was in the process of applying for his visa. They shut down. His passport is in Belfast. He can't move anywhere. You know, he's waiting for the, the, the American consulate to open up so that he can come back into America. Um, no, and it's all legal and it's all legitimate, but I mean, it's just an unfortunate timing, you know. And so he's producing some programming from home, I can tell you. On a plain sense, last weekend um, was the first, was the second weekend in June. Second, first weekend and second weekend in June are the two Sundays, Valerie, when the swallows come back to Capistrano. What do I mean by that? The J1ers arrive in New York. You see them coming off the plane, you see them landing in Gaelic Park, God bless them, looking for jobs and looking for their football and hurling, and away we go. That hasn't happened, obviously. It's not going to happen either this summer. Um, and we're waiting, rather like Ireland is waiting, for the go-ahead from the New York State to say sport is okay. Um, we've had a couple of meetings. John Henchy, as chairman of the board, has brought the teams together, or the clubs together, and said, look, what do we want? It's going to be a different summer here, yeah. um, obviously. Um, you know, how do you want to structure this? And so the plans are in place. It's just we're waiting now for the go-ahead from the um, from New York State, essentially. And you yourself, Larry, how has it impacted you? I know that you're a lecturer in the university near you and you've had to take things online. How has your technology been? Um, let me, I'll answer that question. I say the university technology is fine. My ability to work it might be questionable on a good day. Um, we were given... The middle of March, Valerie, we were sent an email Wednesday evening, no class tomorrow, no class Friday, be ready to go online on Monday. And we were. And so we jumped and we got that. And we worked through the semester and, and got through it. Um, it was fine at one level. Um, at another level, it was god awful because you missed the interaction with the students. They missed the interaction with you, no matter how much they complain about you. Um, but we got through it. We finished up two and a half weeks ago. Now we had, we had graduation. Um, we're coming back in September, thankfully. We're coming back in face-to-face -face classes. But we've all been told, be ready to jump. And by that, they mean be ready to go back online, maybe. So upskill significantly in terms of your, presenta your online presentation skills and your ability to handle technology, which we'll do during the summer, you know. And are you happy to go back in September, Larry? You're, you're more than happy to do that? I'm more than happy to go back. I'm delighted to go back. I miss, I miss the human interaction of being in a classroom um, in a big, big way. Um, and I mean, that's what, that's what half the, the, the crack is about, about teaching is being in the classroom with, with, with the students and stuff like that, you know, as I said, they'll, they'll moan and groan about you, but at some level they, they do enjoy it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going back. Is it a risk? Yeah, it is a risk, but the, I'm sure the university will take all sorts of precautions in terms of tiny classes and stuff like that. And we've adjusted the schedule as well. Um, normally we come back the first Monday in September, we're coming back the third week in August. We'll have no fall break, as they say here in America. 
and then they'll all go home for Thanksgiving, which is the last Thursday in October, which is traditionally four or five days off. Sorry, last four or five days in November, but they won't come back. Um, so they're not being, there's no opportunity for them, for want of a better term, to bring the virus back with them. And so we'll do online exams and stuff like that in, in early December and then finish up. And then I'll head for Ireland, please, God. Great. Yeah, I was just going to say, were you taking it back to when you first left Ireland? I mean, when you immigrated to New York, did you think it was the end of your GA days because you were so heavily involved before you left? Oh, God, no, no, no. I had been here for a couple of summers um, just for the crack. Um, I was a teacher and I was out and I knew what I was getting into. I was going to be involved in, in the club here in, in New York. And I got back in with the Sligo Football Club. I know I knew, knew it wasn't going to be the end of my involvement in the GA at all. Um, but what, what did grow, I suppose, was my administrative involvement. Um, I was young enough when I came out here initially to be able to play Valerie. Uh, yeah. That passed fairly quickly, I can assure you. Um, and then I, I'd moved around the country a little bit. And by the time I came back to New York in 1999, um, I got involved administratively in the New York board. And then things just took off from there. I mean, here at home, during the pandemic, clubs and counties have been taken into their stride by doing fundraisers for the likes of charities, which is amazing to see them all come together. I know you, you yourself even doing that Slanta program, Larry. Yeah, we did. Um, we, we had to raise money ourselves for Slant. I mean, there's about five, about $450,000 in the kitty, I think, in total. The government gave 100000 in New York GA um, to its clubs, to its members through the New York senior football team and the New York hurlers raising funds, raised about another 100,000. Um, so the balance then has come from the community. Um, but the New York hurlers got, not New York footballers, sorry. On the weekend, we were supposed to be playing Galway in Gaelic Park. Uh, ran, went out and ran a 1,000 kilometers. Um, and I think brought in something in the region of $40,000 for the fund. But Valley, what has struck me in, in terms of looking at all of these um, fundraisers that are going on around the country by GEA clubs. And in fairness, I've been asked to do a couple of these little short video snaps, um, endorsing them for clubs. I did one for Curry, for instance, up in Sligo. Um, I did one for Kilcash in Sligo as well. Um, the amount of money that's been raised for non-GEA charities by, by GEA clubs must be phenomenal. You know, I mean, I played for Rahini for a couple of years um, and the weekend before last, maybe two weekends ago, themselves and the, lo the, other, the local rivals, the noisy neighbours down the road in Clontarf, um, ran a competition. Um, they were, I don't know, they were doing distances against each other. But the two clubs raised over 100,000 for the hospice in Rohini. You know, and, and that's phenomenal money. Um, and I'd love to do, I'd love if somebody had the time to just sort of run around the country and say, how much did you raise? Because I, I can only imagine it's phenomenal. I know Paddy Palmer down in, in, in Clannacilty was trying to do something in Cork, I think, and find out. And I did see some figure for Kildare, but I don't know how accurate it was. I think it was 200,000 was raised. And these are not for the G itself. These are for, you know, the Dublin Raider, for instance, cystic fibrosis, P8 house. Um, it must be phenomenal the amount of money that has been raised. Even for your own slant, can people here in Ireland donate to that cause? Yeah, there is. There, there's, a, there's a website called slanta.org. Um, and they go in and they can make a donation to be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, Leitrim Footballers, um, Leitrim Supporters Club, um, did an event for us about a month ago. Um, and I raised, they split it between Pieta House and ourselves. And there'd, there'd be a very strong connection between Leitrim and New York. Seamus Clark, obviously, I alluded to earlier, is the sponsor of the, of the Leitrim football um, team at home. Lots of Leitrim people around the city, lots of Leitrim people involved in the hospitality business here, which has been shut down and which has been decimated, obviously. Um, but they can go on to slinter.org and, and contribute. Great, and rightly so. If anyone wants to do that, you can do it there. I Over the last few weeks, I've been speaking to a few of the players with Munster J in a little series and getting to know their personalities a bit more. And I must say, the majority of them are really enjoying the break. They're, I've asked them all, do you know, and they say, of course, I miss it, but we've, we've really enjoyed this time away. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I mean, no, no more than anybody else, I suppose. I mean, I've seen... Um, press articles which say, do we really want to go back to our pre-COVID life? Um, and, turn, and it, it was manifested in an article by a, a young lady, I think in one of the Irish papers, who said, do I really want to be getting up at 6.30, slapping lunches together, throwing kids into the car and dropping them, you know, half-heartedly at school? You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm at home now. I'm enjoying the crack with them. I'm enjoying interacting with them. I'm enjoying seeing them as people. And we're, none of us are. You know, I think at some level we're all enjoying 
par part of it. Um, obviously, we would hope that it hadn't happened, but there's a, there's a silver lining in it as well. And I'm sure, particularly players, are getting, they're not getting the intense pressure that they might have got through the summer, for instance. And particularly those who have injuries. You know, it gives them a great time to recuperate. No, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we should have a COVID just so fellas can come back from injury. But I can understand where they're coming from. Yeah, and I think maybe some players that would have maybe been tempted to retire this year, you, I don't think anyone would want to retire in the middle of a pandemic because you could slip away under the rocks after all your hard work. So it gives them an opportunity to think, maybe I'll give it one last go. One, one last lash, is right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's there as well, I would suggest to you, you know. And then there, on the other hand, I suppose there are kids who lost out. Um, I think in particular here, fail is a very, very big thing for New York kids. Um, boys and girls because they go home every summer and they play in it so there's this year's fail I have obviously lost out um, and CYC the, the Continental Youth Championship is a massive four-day festival of Gaelic football hurling camogie and ladies football um, which rotates around the, the cities of, of America um, and it's for kids from under eights to under 18s we start at seven o'clock in the morning we finish at seven o'clock at night um, four days of, of competition, that's gone. That didn't happen. Now, some kids will come back and they'll be there next year for it. But I mean, some kids have lost out in that as well, you know? Yeah, no, it is disappointing. I know you mentioned just a few moments ago that all going to plan, you will be coming home maybe at the start probably of the championship. You said you're going to leave here. No, 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 no. Not the start of the championship. Not, not I'll, I'll, be, I'll be home, please God, in January. I'll teach okay. here in the fall. This okay. is from a professional perspective. And in terms of becoming... Um, I, I, I become withdrawn at, at Congress next year. So my, my own family plans are that, well, professionally I have to teach here anyway, mm -hmm. um, that I'd go home in January. What will that change be for you and you and your family? <laughs> God only knows. Um, first of all, I have to find a place to live. Um, and I have been spoiled rotten for the last 20 years because I live 60 yards from the back gate of the university. So if there's a house 60 yards from Croke Park, I might buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it'll be a huge change um, Barbara will stay here initially um, she's completing a, a doctoral degree in education so she wants to finish that the two lads, the two boys um, two boys, two men um, work in the theatre um, so they won't be moving um, they want to stay in New York they, they want to work on Broadway they aspire to work on Broadway so there's no point in them moving to Dublin um, so it'll be different and it'll be different being back in Ireland after what 35 years now, I've been in and out, obviously, very, very frequently of late, but I mean, it will be an adjustment. Of course, it will be an adjustment. And to be there without your family as well, it won't be easy. <laughs> it might You're be very easy. <laughs> <laughs> it might be easy for your family in New York and maybe yourself to break my duty the world of good, Larry. Exactly, but yeah. The restrictions have put a halt, but look, it is important that we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel here and we have, you know, we've dates being brought back and now we've our club coming back first, which is, you know, it's great to see. Yeah. Oh, it is, yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, that would all have been our plan or our idea that the clubs would have come back first. Um, we weren't going to have inter-county games come back first at all. I'll get, I'll get 98% of the players playing um, and then we'll take it from there because, you know, the, it's an honour to play for your county and, and, and it's, it's a tear up. But we'll take care of the mass, first of all, in terms of getting club competitions going and, I think it's 10 weeks in which counties have, have to run their competitions, which hopefully will be plenty of time for them, um, and they'll, they'll get it done. Um, but it, yeah, you're right. It's great to see it coming back, and there's light at the end of the tunnel um, that we'll get games again. And then if we have a championship at the end of the year, wonderful. Um, God forbid we have a second wave of this COVID, and we don't. But look, at least the clubs will be up and running. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that the clubs get a great window of opportunity, but over the last maybe 24 hours, we've heard rumours of some clubs maybe condensing their championship in order to give counties a better chance to train. And it's you don't like to see that either. You'd want them to use the 10 or 11 weeks they've been given. You want them to use the 10 or, week, 10 or 11 weeks that they've been given. Let us breathe. Uh, let us give us the time to sort of adjust to this new normality of COVID officers and give families the opportunity to allow their children to go off and play games and be comfortable about it. I mean, whatever about it being safe, people have to be comfortable. Um, and pressurizing them at this stage into inter-county training or into competitions is, is not a good thing. Give them the time to settle down and let things run and let things run, you know, 
relatively stress-free, I would suggest. Yeah, hopefully so. And hopefully we'll start seeing dates now being released by clubs over the next few weeks. But a lot of clubs are planning on streaming their games, which in sight is brilliant for fans that won't be able to attend the games. Yeah, it is. I mean, we had an offer here, probably the first time ever, we had an offer to, to stream club championship games from New York um, by an entrepreneur in, I think, in Mitchellstone. Um, I don't know where that has gone, um, but it will, yeah. Streaming will give, give them the opportunity to, to see games that they, they would normally attend um, but one would hope that slowly it'll evolve so that they are comfortable attending. Because part and parcel of going to the GA game is not necessarily the GA game itself. It's the, it's the meeting, it's the socialization that goes on around it. And you can't get much of that through a, a Zoom call. You know? yeah. Can you see the likes of the fans returning to our games? Can you see the fans in the, in the stand come maybe championship in October? I can see the fans... Uh, at probably socially distant distancing, um, given uh, the government instructions. Um, but there's no reason why the, the better stadiums wouldn't be able to accommodate large crowds. Now, are you going to get 82,000 swarming people into Croke Park by the end of October? Uh, very, very unlikely. Um, you know, um, I think I've seen a figure of something close to 40,000 can be accommodated there. Um, perhaps down in Parky Cueve, you could accommodate, you know, 20, 20, 25,000. I can see the better stadiums being used um, where you can accommodate social distancing, um, you know, through, the, through this, this championship maybe, you know. I can't imagine the ticket nightmare, Larry, of people saying, I want to go and I get no ticket and season ticket holders. And <laughs> uh, yeah, well, look, their technicalities, we get over those. Look, I'm going to let you go on this a few moments, but lastly, are you, are you looking forward to coming home and taking on the role of being the president of the GA? Oh, God, yeah, very much so. Very excited about the whole idea um, and, and really, really looking forward to, to getting home and, 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 and being there. I mean, it's, a, it's been a bit, a bit of a sort of a blur, actually, since I, I got elected and sort of, it's only beginning to, to, you know, occur to me, perhaps, or, or get into the head now at this stage, but I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Certainly am, you know. It's great, and we're looking forward to having you home. And hopefully, I'll be able to catch up with you in person once all this is over, and instead of the likes of Zoom. But um, best luck with going back teaching, and we'll see you when we see you. We we'll see you at a match somewhere, Valerie. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Spin Southwest.